Okay, teardown time. Uh, this is the Raspberry Pi Zero, making lots of waves right now because it's been so sharply priced for such a tremendous amount of functionality. Uh, in this video, I'm going to take a look at all the engineering and manufacturing that goes on in this assembly. Let's uh, start the two right in the center here because that's the brains of the Raspberry Pi Zero. Uh, this looks like a large integrated circuit, but if one tips on the side here and takes a side look, uh, it becomes quickly apparent there's actually uh, two integrated circuits stacked on top of each other. Uh, this is known as package on package. Um, big trend in the electronics industry, of course, is to squeeze as much as possible in the smallest space as possible, and uh, package on package certainly has a place for that. Uh, on top there, it's marked Elpedia. That's a uh, memory company owned by Micron. Uh, and if you unsolder the top part with a hot air gun, you can see there's a part below it, and it's marked Broadcom, as one might expect, uh, since the Raspberry Pi is basically built around this system on chip. Uh, this circuit here has the uh, processor plus all the peripherals that make a Raspberry Pi possible. So here's the uh, system on chip integrated circuit, the carrier that it was on, and of course the LAN pattern, the circuit board. You can see the silicon die is incredibly small compared to the board area consumed. That's one reason why packaging is such a hotly pursued uh, element of uh, electronics these days, especially as people require more and more miniaturized uh, products. Let's uh, take a look at the die. Okay, uh, this is under the microscope here. You can see the Broadcom logo. We're actually looking at the silicon die. And you can see the actual part number of the die, BCM2708. That doesn't actually match the package part number on the outside. And that pretty much implies that Broadcom may be packaging this die into many different offerings for their customers and then providing a customer visible part number on top. Sometimes they might even blow polyfusions, provide different capabilities to different customers. Not sure which way this one went. If I zoom out a little bit, you can see classic things like this is the bond pads where the actual die gets connected back into that ball grid array package or BGA package so it can be uh, then eventually soldered onto the circuit board. Uh, the peripherals are always on the edge and uh, these are the things like the HDMI, the USB, and then if you go a little bit further in here, you can sort of see a, a large metalization. This is basically the random logic. Some are buried under there will be the ARM processor plus all the random logic that was required to uh, glue the chip together. Okay, well let's flip over the back here and look at some text. There's a UL marking, and right below that's a number, E207844. That's a UL file number, and if you take that number and go into the website shown here, it's going to pop up the vendor of the raw circuit board and it'll tell you all about the class of circuit board and even the address actually. Here's the address of it. And of course, as you might imagine, you can just type that into Google and um, it zooms into the street view of actually where the plant is. And of course, if you zoom out a little bit here, uh, it's a city just uh, north of Hong Kong, a very active area for electronics design. A big classic bit of industrial intelligence you can do from this number. Below that, uh, the date code, 42nd week of 2015. Um, that's a sell-through, basically, calculation. I now know the raw board is made of the 42nd week. Uh, this video is being done on December 6th. Uh, so the board, of course, is manufactured somewhere uh, in China. It was stuffed. Uh, it was shipped out. I bought it through Adafruit. So my board came out of New York City, then shipped over to the West Coast here. So uh, that's a very short uh, sell-through, basically. That, that's a number you always check to see if material is moving through the pipeline. No surprise with the Raspberry Pi Zero being so popular that the dates here are very close together. Uh, so here's the whole back view, and uh, let's look at this connector on one side here. Uh, it's not populated because it's not normally required in the operation of a Raspberry Pi, but I'm pretty sure this is the JTAG connector. Joint Test Access Group is what it stands for. Uh, originally a design protocol for testing uh, circuit boards that they're connected directly and soldered properly. Uh, later very much expanded and uh, it's probably the prime interface for accessing uh, the CPU on the integrated circuit. Uh, you can get some uh, tools, I'll just pop up some typical ones. The search of JTAG and Raspberry Pi pulls up all sorts of rich tool sets. Uh, at the very high end of embedded software development, uh, you tend to program bare metal and there's no need for an operating system. And uh, these the JTAG debuggers will actually allow you to single step through the registers, look at absolutely everything. Uh, so flipping the board back over, uh, this is the land pattern for the BJ Soic. Uh, the Raspberry Pi Zero has considerably less peripherals than the uh, Raspberry Pi 2, so I don't know if they didn't route out some of the traces, but the only way to really figure that out is to actually uh, take a look at the land pattern. Uh, the foundation doesn't seem to publish the schematics very quickly, so only the way to find that out. 
Uh, on the extreme right side of the board is a power system. Looks like there's two inductors there, which implies there's probably two buck regulators, basically taking the voltage down from the 5 volts at the USB. On the left-hand side, uh, just some discretes there for the HDMI interface. And right next to it, the crystal that's required for the operation of the SOIC. And that's about it. And of course, that's really the theme of the whole thing. It's just an astonishingly small number of components for what essentially is a very uh, decent performing Linux computer.